one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode is actually this morning's episode. In fact, it's April 1st, 2023, and the first Saturday morning session of General Conference has just completed. I have been here listening, taking notes, watching, seeing what's happening so I can report it to you in digest form. Yes, here at Radio Free Mormon, I'm watching General Conference so you don't have to. The first thing of interest to note is that President Nelson was at General Conference. He was sitting in his chair, somewhat rigid and almost lifelike. The interesting thing to note is that he did not say one word during this morning session of General Conference. He gave the conducting over to President Oaks. This is in contrast to six months ago, when in the Saturday morning session, President Nelson spoke not once, but twice during that session. So I don't know what's going on with him not saying anything during the morning session. One could suspect it has something to do with his health. On the health front, though, there was a special announcement that was made that Elder Holland is not, repeat, not present during general conference because he has been smitten with COVID. Neither he nor his wife were present, apparently, according to the announcement by President Oaks. One only hopes that he will get over his COVID in time to address the student body at Southern Utah University at the end of this month of April at their commencement address. Inasmuch as the leaders of that university have decided that in spite of the student's protest about having him speaking, he's going to speak anyway. Unless, of course, God intervenes and gets him off the hook by a conveniently timed bout of covid Gary Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve was the first speaker. He spoke about Easter in terms of family celebrations of Easter. It was clear that his talk was designed to focus on Jesus Christ, which is all to the good in a church that prides itself over and over again about bearing the name of Jesus Christ. He compared celebrations of Christmas, which tend to be more involved and lengthy and protracted with family celebrations of Easter and encouraged the members of the church to come up with different ways that they could celebrate Easter in a similarly festive way as Christmas. Elder Stevenson suggested recognizing additional holidays to Easter, including Palm Sunday and Good Friday, as some of our other Christian brothers and sisters do. Now, these are not necessarily quotes. I'm taking down notes as quickly as I can, but he did make a reference to other churches and their celebration of additional holidays related to the Easter cycle and suggested that we do likewise, which is an interesting thing. He also reached out to the idea of other unnamed cultures and the way that they celebrate Easter and that we could take things from them. Noteworthy was the fact that he quoted from a non LDS scholar, and this time it wasn't C.S. Lewis. He quoted from N.T. Wright. Those are the initials N.T. Wright of a famous New Testament scholar, whom he quoted to the effect that if we were to give up celebrating Christmas, we would lose one or two chapters from the New Testament referencing the nativity accounts in Luke and Matthew. But if we gave up Easter, well, then we've given up the entire New Testament. I thought it was a good quote. I thought it was wonderful that he's introducing N.T. Wright to an audience of Latter-day Saints who hopefully will be able to read some of what he has written, listen to some of the things he has said, and perhaps grow in truth and knowledge. But of course, in addition to the New Testament, Elder Stevenson focuses on the Book of Mormon because it is the Book of Mormon, chapter 11, which is the best Easter story. We've talked about the New Testament. The New Testament is great and all that, but the Book of Mormon has the supernal, superior the best, I'm telling you, the best Easter story of anybody when Jesus comes to the Nephites, at least the ones who are still alive after he's been busy destroying all the wicked ones <laughs> over a number of days. But those who are still alive have a great experience and they get to come forward and feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. That is the Easter story par excellence. And so Elder Stevenson says that even as they, as a family, his family reads Luke chapter 2 during Christmas time with the Christmas story that he is going to start this new tradition and encourage others to do likewise of reading 3rd Nephi chapter 11 as the Easter story and as part of their family Easter celebrations. Elder Stevenson went on to talk about an unnamed friend of his whose life was cut short by illness. 
Now, I don't think he said what it was the illness was that cut this woman's life short. What he did not say, however, was that a priesthood blessing healed her. So I think this qualifies as the first story on the General Conference, Death March. People who are faithful Mormons who die suddenly, shortly, untimely by illness and die by illness that the priesthood is not able to cure by means of priesthood blessings. Once again, I don't mean to make fun or light of people dying from illness, especially untimely deaths. That's awful. I'm just doing it to contrast the idea with faithful Mormons dying from such illnesses, even though they've received, obviously, many priesthood blessings from those who at least allegedly have the power to heal them. Unfortunately, we don't seem to hear many of those stories in general conference. All we hear are the stories about people who die in spite of receiving those priesthood blessings. So that's number one on the general conference death march. Then Elder Stevenson pulls an Elder Holland. He holds up an original copy of the Book of Mormon. Yes, Elder Holland may not be there in the flesh, but he's certainly there in the spirit. Now, this is not the 1837 copy of the Book of Mormon, which Elder Holland held up to the audience in a prior somewhat infamous talk at General Conference and identified it as the very book that Hiram was reading to Joseph on that faithful day in Carthage on June 27, 1844. This is simply a generic 1830 original volume of the Book of Mormon held up by Elder Stevenson to talk about how important it is. And he was holding it with his bare hands as well. I hope they got that back under safety as soon as he was done speaking because I understand that an original copy of the Book of Mormon can be kind of pricey, if you know what I mean. Elder Stevenson concludes by encouraging the audience to read from the Book of Mormon and he bears his testimony of the Book of Mormon. Speaker number two is Bonnie Corden. I was shocked to see her showing up. She seemed very, very healthy, very happy, very full of the spirit. I was wondering if she was going to tell a story about the unfortunate incident with her grandson, Derek, dying at Disney World in December of 2016. She did not repeat, not make any reference to her grandson dying. However, she seems to have not been able to resist talking about her own father who died. So, yeah, she's got to tell a story, it seems like, every time about somebody who dies and draw some kind of spiritual significance from it. This was her father, who was actually a general authority. His name was Harold Hilliam. That's H-I-L-L-I-A-M, Harold Hilliam. Not Harold Hill, but Harold Hilliam. And she tells a story about how in 2011, she received word, while of course she was serving with her husband as mission presidents, which really isn't true. Her husband was serving as a mission president. She was serving as his wife whatever they call it nowadays, but that's what she's doing. And she got a phone call. It was from her dad. He told her on the phone that he had been diagnosed with ALS, which is really unfortunate. I think that's also called Lou Gehrig's disease. And he explained to her that what it means is, is that his mind is going to continue to be active while his body slowly but surely shuts down. And that is the terrible thing about the ALS diagnosis that her dad received. And, you know, he's a general authority. I know he's getting priesthood blessings all over the place from people with more power than I have. And apparently none of them did any good because he died shortly thereafter. So once again, General Conference Death March, this is number two in the entries for that march. And this is only the Saturday morning session. I don't think there were any others that I noted. So there's two so far in the General Conference Death March with Bonnie Corden's dad, Harold Hilliam, being number two. Please observe me if you will. I'm Professor Harold Hill, and I'm here to start a River City Boys band. Ba-ram. I may cut that out. Anyway, she also said that what her dad told her was never pass up an opportunity to testify of Jesus Christ. And she thought that was very important, and she wants to build her entire talk and general conference about this. She talks about some young women that she knows. She is the young women's general president, so she's going to give some stories about young women and how faithful they are and how well they illustrate the point she's trying to make. There was a young woman named Livy who watched General Conference and watched it actively, and from watching General Conference gained enough strength to decline an invitation from friends some days later to an inappropriate movie, quote-unquote. I don't know what movie that was, but I'm glad she had the strength, this young Livy to decline that invitation, which she got from watching General Conference. Then there was Maddie, who was 13 years old. Now, Maddie is very important in this talk, I think, because even though she's 13, her mom and her dad stop going to church. Well, Maddie makes the decision that she will press on, she will continue, she will go to church 
alone, even though she's 13. And through her good example, her younger brothers start going to church. And indeed, her mom and her dad come back to church. The message I'm getting from this is that if you're young and everybody else is leaving the church, you keep going and eventually they will come back too and follow your good example. She talks about following the commandments and being like Christ. She talks about how her dad has been gone for 11 years now, but she asked the audience to join her in following her dad's admonition to look for Christ everywhere. And Bonnie promises that he is there, which I guess means everywhere, even though he's hard to see. As I put it one time a few weeks ago regarding the penchant that Mormons have for finding miracles in coincidences and thereby divining the reality of God from those coincidences. What I had said was this, God hides behind the trees in the forest of coincidence. So let's see if there's anything else here. No story about Derek, but yes, a story about her dad's death and Bonnie can take her seat. And we go on to the next speaker whose name was Carl B. Cook. Now he's in the presidency of the 70. I don't recall seeing this gentleman before, he has a kind of a nice demeanor. It's a bit goofy, but it's affable. And he gets up there and he tells a story about how when he had just been called around 20 years ago to be an area authority, and it's the first time that he is presiding at a state conference. So very first time, he's a newbie, he's wet behind the ears, and as if it's not stressful enough, Boyd K. Packer, who was still then the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve, contacts him and says, hey, you mind if I come along with you? Well, apparently Boyd K. Packer has a prank in mind that he wants to play on Carl B. Cook. And here is the prank that Boyd K. Packer plays on him. They're there at the conference. Actually, they're not at the conference yet. It's the leadership meeting. And at the leadership meeting, when all the leadership people from all over the stake are present, Boyd K. Packer tells Carl B. Cook that the plan that he's already worked out with the stake president in minute detail for all the meetings is scrapped. We're not doing that, Carl. No plans. We're going in this just talking by the spirit, okay? All we're talking by is the spirit. You don't get to take any notes in advance. That's what the whole thing's going to be about. And Carl, of course, I mean, he's got to say yes because it's Boyd K. Packer. So he says, okay, whatever you say. They get there to the meeting. He sees Boyd K. Packer making some notes. Now, of course, by this point, Boyd K. Packer has given millions, if not billions of talks <laughs> in church, in general conference, in all sorts of venues. He has given talks everywhere. He's got to have at least a dozen, if not two dozen talks at the tip of his tongue that he can draw on at any time. Unlike Carl Cook, who's the greenie. So now... Boyd K. Packer, according to Carl Cook's story, gets up there in front of the leadership conference, speaks for 15 minutes on the spirit, and then he says, and now Carl Cook is going to address us for 15 minutes. So Carl gets up there and he talks, he says, for like 14 minutes. He drained everything out of him that he had to say. He still came up a minute short and he sat down. Well, Boyd K. Packer gets up again and talks for 15 minutes about teaching by the spirit. And then he says at the end of his 15 minutes, now Carl Cook is going to talk to us for another 15 minutes. Now, this is actually kind of a funny story. And the way Carl Cook tells it, he gets some what I think is genuine laughter from the audience. But of course, it's genuine laughter at the difficult and embarrassing position that a person is put in intentionally by a church leader. Now, that's problematic, I think, when I start thinking about it. Why are church leaders who are supposed to be disciples of Christ and not frat boys putting their other leaders, their subordinate leaders, in positions in public where they are embarrassed? I don't understand it. It seems less like Jesus and more like Animal House to me. But this is the story. And so he gets up. He's got 15 minutes. He's got nothing to say, but he stumbles through as best he can. He sits down. This is just the leadership meeting, remember? We haven't even gotten to the real meeting. And Boy K. Packer gets up again, speaks for 15 minutes about following the Spirit. And he says, and now Brother Cook is going to talk to us for another 15 minutes. I mean, at some point, this crosses over from being funny, if it's funny in the first place, to actually being cruel. Because now he has him up there. He's got no idea what to say. He's totally flummoxed. And I don't know what he said. I wasn't there. I'm guessing it wasn't brilliant. And it probably wasn't inspiring. It was mostly embarrassing for the audience. And definitely embarrassing for Elder Cook. Who still venerates the memory of Boyd K. Packer. In spite of all of this. So, 
Then that meeting's over. Thank goodness, right? Now they go to the regular meeting with the entire stake there. And Boyd K. Packer does the same freaking thing to him all three times. 15 minutes, Boyd. Okay, Brother Cook will speak to us for the next 15 minutes. 15 minutes, Boyd. Brother Cook, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, Boyd. Brother Cook, 15 minutes. Well, I'm sure that that was quite a memorable experience for Carl Cook. And the lesson that he learns from it is that he's glad that he kept going. Because he didn't want to keep going. He's being made an ass out of in front of all these people by his superior, his apostle of Jesus Christ superior. Of course, he doesn't want to continue going. But he goes and he keeps going anyway because that's what we're supposed to do as Mormons. No matter how offensive the church leaders may be, we have to continue trudging on, put our shoulder to the wheel and push along. And he's glad he kept going because now he's in the presidency of the, the 70, right? Wow, how wonderful for him. So that was the story that he told. Oh, and what a dick Elder Packer was. Because after it was all over, and after he had run Elder Cook through this ringer, this is Carl Cook, through the ringer, Elder Packer says to him with a smile, let's do it again sometime. That was supposed to be a laugh line. Everybody laughed. This guy's a total dick. Elder Packer is a dick. That should be the title of this whole talk when it shows up in Enzyme is Boyd K. Packer was a dick. Okay, now we get to Elder Gong, known among his associates as Mr. Charisma. Elder Gong talks about ministering, and this is what he's talking about, ministering, 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 which used to be home teaching, home teaching, home teaching. Now, the thing that was so interesting about it to me was that first off, he's talking about how great the members are. They minister to those who are weak, who are poor, who are uh, having all these difficulties, right? I think that's great on its face. But now with the SEC announcement from a few weeks ago, and now we know that the church has $157 billion in the Enzyme Peak account and almost $50 billion just in the U.S. stock market alone, and that the church was defrauding the federal government in order to hide from its own members how much money they had made in tithing from the members. And after we find out all this, it sounds just a little bit hollow to hear Elder Gong talking about members visiting other members and helping them out when they're down and out. When the church is sitting on over $150 billion in the bank account. So that was one thing. And this is one of the problems with the members knowing about this. Is that we can take that fact and compare it to what they're saying and say, you know, one of these things doesn't belong here. This doesn't make sense. If you have all this money, why aren't you helping people out instead of just talking about these little tiny things that the members can do to help each other. He also made a very, very interesting comment about the reports of ministering. In other words, the ministering reports. We all know that we're supposed to do our home teaching. That's what it used to be not that long ago. Ministering, right? We make contact with members of the ward to whom we are assigned. And then at the end of the month, we pass that information up to another person who passes it up to the bishop, state president, blah, blah, blah. It goes all the way to Salt Lake, and that's where they keep all the records. Well, what Elder Gong said was that there is a quote-unquote ministering gap that exists, which he defined as this. He says that there are more reports of people being ministered to than there are reports of people saying that they have been ministered to. So, in other words... They're filing fake reports. They're saying they're visiting members more than they're actually visiting the members. And he encouraged people to not do that. Well, that makes sense, yeah. But this is like what was on uh, Mormon Stories, I think it was recently, where they were talking with the bishop down in Mexico and talking about how he was encouraged by somebody above him in leadership to inflate artificially those numbers. In other words, to report that they were visiting and ministering to more members than they actually were because it made the people above them look better in the eyes of the people above them. This is going on. I'm fascinated that Elder Gong actually mentioned it in General Conference. I think that's a good thing he mentioned in General Conference, and hopefully people will do better about that. The problem is that he also talked about a ward that focused on having 100% ministering. So at the same time as he's decrying the fake reporting of inflated numbers. He is also playing into the idea of why it is that they inflate those numbers in the first place because they're not doing 100% ministering, but they know they're supposed to. Therefore, numbers are going to get 
inflated. Let's see what else we have here. Oh, we have Elder Cook. Next is Elder Cook. He's going to talk about the gathering of Israel over and over and over again. That is the main point of his talk because it's been the main point of President Nelson's presidency. He quotes from Spencer W. Kimball a number of years ago in which Spencer Kimball was already making this switch from a literal gathering of Israel to a non-literal gathering of Israel, where he says that now it used to be that you would gather to one place. I mean, there was actually a gathering. It's the article of faith that says that we believe in the literal gathering of Israel. Well, now we don't believe in a literal gathering of Israel. We believe that if you simply join the church, you're being gathered as Israel. When you're not going anywhere, you're just staying in place. And what they had said was, you're not gathering to Zion anymore. You're gathering to the different stakes of Zion, which just means you go to church every Sunday in the building that is there for going to church, wherever it might be in the world. So this kind of thing has been going on since Spencer Kimball. It's been put on steroids by President Nelson. And the problem is, is that they continue to talk about this, Elder Cook did, as a literal gathering of Israel. It's not a literal gathering of Israel. It is anything but a literal gathering of Israel. They have simply changed the definition of gathering from what it was in the article of faith, but they're still going to talk about it as if it's still a literal gathering. Elder Cook quotes President Nelson as saying, if you do anything, anywhere, anytime that helps somebody on either side of the veil make and or keep covenants, then you are participating in the gathering of Israel. It's that simple. Yeah, that was part of the quote. It's that simple. It's that simple and it's that nonsensical as well. Also, Elder Cook says, growth occurs everywhere. He's talking about church growth. He says, growth occurs everywhere, especially in Africa and South America. But it's that growth occurs everywhere part that I have to take issue with because growth in the church is not, repeat, not occurring everywhere. In fact, it's going the other way and he knows it. Elder Cook is not telling the truth now any more than he was a few years ago when he famously said in general conference that the state of the church is strong. We are stronger than we've ever been. This is the story that he wants to continue to promote and keep alive in spite of the fact that the church is not growing everywhere. And in fact, in most places, it's shrinking. There may be some exceptions in Africa, and I'm not so sure about South America, actually. But apparently, he wanted to throw that in there so Africa wasn't standing all alone. The next talk was from Elder Alan Haney. He even looked kind of like Mr. Haney from Green Acres, if you remember him. Mr. Haney. Anyway, he talks about a story when he was a kid And he's uh, looking for cartoons on TV, and he happens to see a part of General Conference. There's a guy with white hair. He asks his brother who that guy is sitting in the nice chair. It's President McKay. And, oh, really? And his brother tells him he's a prophet. And he had this little feeling in his heart that, wow, this guy really is a prophet. But then he went on and looked for more cartoons, and that's the end of the story. Well, this whole story now is going to serve as his basis for telling the audience that because he had that feeling about this guy in the white chair when he was a kid looking for cartoons, now what that means is that he has a testimony of the prophet. I'm sure there's other things that have happened since then, but this is the one he mentions, that he has a testimony of a prophet. And what a testimony of a prophet means to him is that he doesn't have to spend any time worrying about whether the prophet is speaking as a man or speaking as a prophet. Because whatever he says is what the Lord wants him to say. And if you follow whatever the living prophet says, you will not be put at risk for spiritual damnation. You do what the prophet says and you will be blessed regardless of whether he was speaking as a man or speaking as a prophet, apparently. He also adds to this that you should not be comparing what older prophets or dead prophets have said against what current prophets or living prophets are saying. So old prophets are out. Don't be looking at what they said. If it contradicts what the current prophet says, that's not a good activity. You're not supposed to do that. Instead, just listen to the living prophet, do everything he says, and you will be fine. He also tells an interesting story about being in the cafeteria, I guess at the church office building, and the first presidency were sitting at a table. There was one empty chair. He goes by it because he doesn't feel like he's worthy to sit at the same table with the first presidency. They call him over. They have him sit down. So he's sitting at a table with the first presidency. They're having lunch. He hears a crunching sound toward the end of the lunch, and he looks up. 
I don't know what he was looking at before. The first presidency's there. <laughs> but he looks over. President Nelson has now taken his like avian water bottle or whatever it was, you know, with the real cheap plastic, and you can crush it real easy. And he has taken it and crushed it down flat and then put the lid back on so it'll retain the shape. And Elder Haney asks him why he's doing that. And he says, well, I'm doing this because it makes it easier to handle for those who are doing the recycling. It doesn't take up as much space, you know, those kind of things that pretty much everybody knows, I think. But he did this and crushed it down. And then he says that, then he saw that President Oaks did the same thing with his water bottle and President Eyring did, did the same thing with his water bottle. And what was it? His, his, um, I'm not sure exactly what his point was. I'm sorry, except that the prophet cares about uh, the ecology and the counselors will follow his example and how Elder Haney followed his example, how we should all follow his example. You know, it is amazing to me. I got to tell you, it did remind me about the scene from Jaws, of course, where Quint is crushing the, the beer can and Hooper responds by crushing the styrofoam cup. But other than that, really, we have an encounter being related in general conference about the first presidency. And this is the best we have that they crush water bottles for recycling purposes. Is this really the best stories they have about the first presidency? Apparently, since it's being told in general conference, I mean, I read the old Testament, Moses parts the red sea, but president Nelson crushes water bottles. It seems that, you know, it's not really on the same par. There seems to have been a decline somewhat in the miracle stories since Old Testament times to General Conference today. Oh, another thing that Elder Haney says, you know, he's one of these 70 guys who gets up there and says all the things that the apostles don't dare to say. He's going to take the flack. He's going to be the fall guy for giving all these potentially criticizable and critiquable talks. He also talks about parents and how when they raise their kids, that the parents have to be really, really perfect because if they stray just a little bit, the kids are going to get older, they're going to see they strayed, and they're going to really stray. So the result is, of course, that the parents are the ones to blame for all the youth leaving the church because they haven't been perfect enough. There's no accountability by the leaders. There's nothing about they've been hiding shit from the members for 200 years. They're still hiding stuff from the members. Nothing has been said about the SEC fine yet. I expect that nothing will because, as we know, they have said they consider the case closed. But the leaders have no responsibility for anything in this church. And when the youth and other members are leaving like rats off a sinking ship, it's the parent's fault. You need to understand that it's your fault. If you don't feel bad enough already about not being able to do everything that you're supposed to do, well, here's something else that we can put on your shoulders. And maybe this will sink you to the bottom of the ocean. And it closes off with President Eyring. President Eyring is the last speaker in the Saturday morning session of General Conference. He's going to talk about peace. Peace is his big thing. He wants peace, peace, peace. In fact, he reads almost half the New Testament in this passage about peace. And then he says he's learned five things from it, five very unremarkable things from this passage that peace is given after we keep the commandments. God's not going to give you peace before you keep the commandments, of course. Number two, the Holy Ghost comes and abides with us. Wow. Number three, keep your covenants and you will feel the love of God. Number four, keeping the commandments is more than obedience. We have to love God with everything we have. So it's not just enough to be obedient. Now we have to love God on top of that. And five, we get peace, which I thought was the same as number one, but maybe he lost track there, or maybe I did. I may have been drowsing by that point in his talk. But, but, he says, even though we definitely receive peace when we follow all the commandments of God, there are all these members of the church who are following all the commandments of God who aren't receiving the peace that's promised. How does he deal with that strange contradiction? Easy. Satan. Satan is the one who's making it so you don't feel that peace that's promised if you live the gospel and obey the commandments. Once again, Satan is put in a more powerful position than God. Satan can upend God's promises with a snap of his fingers, apparently. And at the end, he talks about the youth who are leaving the church. He doesn't say leaving the church, though. He says they are taking the path of sorrow. So all the kids and all the people who are leaving the church are taking the path of sorrow because there's once again only true happiness in the LDS church. Any happiness outside the church is fake happiness. It's really sorrow, but people are smiling just to fool you that they are actually happy, right? They're actually miserable, but they're pretending to be happy in order to fool you. That sounds like what I've experienced in the LDS church 
fooling people, being miserable, but pretending to be happy in order to make people think that you're really happy so you'll join the church. This is a case of Elder Iring pointing one finger at people who've left the church with three fingers pointing back at him and the other members of the church. And finally, in an astonishing thing, at the end of his talk, he actually appeared to be prophesying a miraculous growth in church membership that will be present to greet the Savior when he comes again. And all this will happen through the light of Christ and all this peace, 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 happiness, and joy. So President Iring, not big on the specifics, but I think definitely on the record now with a prediction of incredible church growth. We'll see if President Iring's prediction of this church growth turns out any better than Elder Holland's prediction of having over 100,000 missionaries some years ago. That didn't work out, in case you're wondering. Okay, so that should be it for the end of the first session of General Conference. I'm going to try and get this edited and up in time so I can listen to the second session and hopefully do the same thing with that. That's about all for right now. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air. (laughs) 